Welcome everyone, my name is Anne Lord, Librarian at the AWRI and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. It is also my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, Adrian Coulter, Senior Oenologist at the Australian Wine Research Institute. In this webinar, Adrian will discuss the causes of stuck fermentations, the best ways to manage fermentations, tools to monitor fermentation performance, and procedures to restart stuck fermentations. Before I hand over to Adrian to get us started, a couple of quick notes on what to expect for those that are new to AWRI webinars. The format for today is a short presentation followed by a Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view via the AWRI website. It's important to remember that webinars are interactive and that there are a number of ways to get involved. To ask a question, please type in the questions into the questions section of your control panel in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For those of you with access to a microphone, there is also the option of speaking directly with our presenter by clicking the raise hand button. This is located in the top left section of your control panel. Please feel free to send through questions at any time and once we get to the Q&A, I will get as many questions through to Adrian as possible. Finally, if you would like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Okay, that's enough from me for now and I'm going to hand over to Adrian to tell us more about today's topic. Hi, so stuck fermentations, um, it's some, well, sometimes when we're talking to problem, um, talking to people about problems over the phone, uh, when people call up with issues, you know, sometimes we can talk through the whole process and work out something in particular which has caused an issue, like maybe perhaps a, a large change in temperature. But uh, often it's a complex one making issue and it, it can be difficult to find uh, one particular thing that might have caused the issue. Often it's a multifactorial issue. Uh, you know, some some factors on themselves might not be uh, or might not cause a problem, but altogether uh, these things uh, sort of add up uh, and, and contribute to uh, stark fermentation. So, as I said, it seems to be a, uh, a combination uh, of factors that might occur individually without consequence, but together they contribute to a stark fermentation. So uh, things in type of yeast, uh, what nutrients are available, presence of toxic substances uh, and fermentation conditions. Um, what we have noticed uh, in the past decade or so is that it does seem to be uh, exacerbated by hot weather and I'll show a slide shortly about that, uh, showing that. Um, and of course, as we all know, the uh, stuck ferments can be costly in terms of time, energy, uh, yeast and loss of wine quality. So the ADABRI has been providing a, a technical problem solving service to levy payers for, for many years now and we receive queries about all aspects of, of wine making uh, and we now call this service ADABRI's help desk. Uh, now we would categorise the queries we receive uh, and this slide, sh slide shows the stuck ferment queries as a percentage of the total queries received from 1993 to 2016 uh, up to uh, uh, June 2016. Uh, you can see that stuck ferment queries uh, on average represent maybe 1 to 2% uh, of all our queries, although some years we receive more, for example 2013, you can see that big peak there, uh, stuck ferment queries represented about 5% of all our queries that year. Now I must stress here that these suppliers uh, like Lelamond and Lefort also re receive queries on stuck ferments uh, and winemakers might go and seek other 
uh, other winemakers they know. So these aren't all the stuck fermentation problems, of course, across Australia. It's just the ones that people come to us with. And so it can be difficult to say how big a uh, problem stuck fermentation is every year, but certainly uh, the data here shows uh, it does turn up. Uh, it does seem to be occurring. Um, so in the previous slide, I said stuck fermentation can be a common seasonal problem exacerbated by hot weather. Uh, and if we look at these uh, since 2008, and we look at 2008, 2013, 2016, those red ones there where we had the most queries, um, those were years where we had um, a, a, a heat waves uh, around the country, um, particularly 2008, um, uh, very bad heat waves in, in, in uh, South Australia, uh, and you know, 2013, 2016 certainly had heat waves around. Um, our more recent experiences are heat waves certainly increase the likelihood of stuck fermentations, um, and uh, I'll explain that shortly. So just using 2008 uh, vintage uh, as, a, as an example, um, sorry, just technical difficulties here. Um, so yeah, 2008 is a good example of what can happen in hot years, uh, and this slide summarises that. So the main factors, high BOME obviously leads to high alcohol. Uh, high alcohol, um, I'll talk about a lot during this, this talk after, afterwards, but alcohol certainly is one of the big factors uh, in uh, stuck fermentations. High temperature, uh, not just of of the uh, the ferment itself, but high temperature of the of the fruit and encouragement of microbial growth, uh, capacity of winery cooling systems to cool down the, the hot fruit as it comes in, and fermentation temperature, uh, yeah, and of course uh, yeast bacteria interactions and high volatile acidity, uh, and possibly residual ag agrochemical uh, agrochemicals as, as uh, inhibitory substances. So just to give you an idea, uh, in 2008 we had several stuck ferments with very high VAs, and this slide shows the results of a typical high VA stuck ferment. So the VA is almost two grams per litre, which is certainly going to inhibit fermentation. Um, at pH 3.8 uh, uh, is quite high and encourages the growth of non-saccharomyces yeast and lactobacillus bacteria. Uh, Pseudobacteria bacteria, um, and apart from being volatile, many of those high VA wines also exhibited mousy off flavour. So, uh, main risk factors: uh, a choice of yeast. So, obviously, a, a low alcohol fermenting yeast isn't going to be good, you know, in in hot weather when you've got high sugar. Uh, starter culture is very important, and we've been talking about that for many for many years, like preparing a, a strong starter culture. Uh, inoculation techniques, um, temperature differences between um, the uh, yeast inoculant, inoculant and the actual juice. Uh, temperature stress, changes in uh, temperature or high temperature or too low a temperature. Uh, vigor and sedimentation. Uh, there's nutrient, nutrient deficiencies. Um, first one, of course, is yeast available or yeast assimilable nitrogen, um, and consequences of too little and sometimes too much of that. Uh, if we add too much, uh, oxygen, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. These things will all will always come up in textbooks. Uh, inhibitory factors. Ethanol is by far probably the most important here. Uh, as it seems to exacerbate any other uh, inhibitory factor. Uh, fatty acids, which are involved in uh, inhibitory, uh, inhibiting um, fermentation, and ethanol, high ethanol accentuates that as well. Sulfur dioxide, uh, microorganism interactions, and agrochemical residues, as I mentioned before. So I'm going to start 
here with, with alcohol. Um, you know, uh, all alcohols are, are toxic to varying degrees. Uh, and you can see here in the effects of uh, alcohol on human beings. Uh, this person certainly isn't performing well after drinking a whole lot. Uh, but yeast is the same. And although Saccharomyces shows considerable ethanol tolerance, ethanol still becomes toxic when its concentration becomes too high. But ethanol still becomes disrupting to yeast metabolism even at, at lower concentrations. So ethanol is the most important inhibitory factor for, for Saccharomyces. Um, basically the phenomenon of alcohol tolerance is essentially a measure of the yeast membrane's permeability or functionality in the presence of increasing alcohol concentration. Um, so, uh, Ethanol inhibits the transport into the cell of many nutrients and substances such as glucose, ammonium and amino acids. Uh, many of the transport systems in yeast are proton synthols, coupling the uptake of amino acid molecule, for example, to that of a hydrogen ion. So to take in the nutrients, uh, it takes in a hydrogen ion at the same time. Now because ethanol makes the cell membrane more permeable, the rate of this proton or passive proton flux into the yeast, so not through the symports, but just passively going through the membrane to yeast cell is increased. So the yeast cell accumulates hydrogen ions, which it finds hard to get rid of. So it gets a whole lot of these hydrogen ions uh, in the cell and it has to shunt them out and it uses a whole lot of ATP to do that, so it's a lot of energy. So basically the cell has to stop the proton symport nutrient transport system because too many protons are leaking into the cell from the membrane. So that basically means it stopped taking in nutrients, uh, which obviously is going to have negative effects. So ethanol also increases the toxicity, toxicity of other compounds, such as the medium chain length fatty acids, uh, the C6, C8, C9 fatty acids. Um, and there are many other factors that are synergistic with alcohol, including pH, temperature, acetic acid, sugar. As I mentioned, high alcohol just makes everything else that might be moderately toxic even more toxic. Um, the fact that ethanol increases toxicity of other compounds pretty well explains why these compounds might not be problematic early in fermentation, but might be uh, problematic when the fermentation comes to later stages. So, slide just sort of giving an example that um, uh, ethanol tolerance is strain dependent. Uh, so I won't spend time there just to show that you certainly some strains can handle a lot higher alcohol than, than other, other strains. So something else that's been sort of exacerbating uh, stuck ferments and alcohol is so toxic to use when it becomes high concentrations is that the, uh, the mean alcohol concentration in wines, uh, particularly red wines showing here in this slide, has been increasing uh, over the past 20 years. Um, so as a general trend upwards there, it's probably seems to have leveled out now around about maybe 14 percent, but uh, you know, back in the early 80s or mid 80s it was 12 and a half. Uh, and sometimes we wonder whether that has had an effect and increased the, possibly the um, uh, in, incidence of stuck fermentations. So just while we're on uh, uh, yeast variability, uh, and I mentioned about 2008 we had a lot of wines with high acetic acids. You can see the yeast in this slide, you can see that they um, uh, also vary in their tolerance to acetic acid. But you can see that this from this graph that fermentation rate, which is on the, on the y-axis, uh, decreases with increasing concentration of acetic acid on the x-axis. So while there's variability, it's certainly a high acetic acid, slows down the fermentation. Um, so more again on the line of heat waves and high temperatures, uh, you know, high temperatures in the vineyard uh, and during, during vintage, high temperature can cause the berries to split. And if they split, then they can uh, dehydrate uh, and leak sugar, which then becomes a substrate for microbial, microbial growth. So then 
under these circumstances you're going to have a higher microbial load than usual and then mechanical harvesting can cause further damage to the fruit which stimulates further growth of indigenous microorganisms during transport to the winery and after a lag phase these, these uh, microorganisms can accumulate nutrients uh, including nitrogen compounds and vitamins uh, which then aren't available to Saccharomyces later on. Um, investigations done here in the past too has shown that picking bins used several times and not washed out properly or sanitised can build up a high population of wild yeast uh, and the toxins excreted by the, these yeasts could potentially be, potentially be enough to inhibit fermentation. Um, so these, these yeast uh, compromise the ability of inoculated yeast to dominate uh, the microflora and again leading to potential uh, depletion of essential nutrients. So what can you do about this situation? Uh, if we have um, these increased population then obviously we need to use more sulfur dioxide which is going to help prevent microbial both and growth and oxidation. Um, plus as I'm addition to musts and ferments to control uh, bacteria development has been suggested but that's only going to kill lactic acid bacteria but not acetic acid bacteria. Um, we believe that in 2008 the mousiness was generally formed by the lactic acid bacteria. Um, so sanitising the bins, adding more sulphur dioxide, uh, making sure that the bins are, are washed out properly and sanitised and washed uh, and the san any sanitizer rinsed out properly and covering the bins during transport will stop yeah, a further increase in temperature um, in that situation. So just going on to uh, another risk factor, uh, insufficient nitrogen. Uh, now nitrogen, there's only a couple of sources of nitrogen from the vineyard and then what we can add as winemakers. Uh, and nitrogen accumulation in the berry can be influenced by a number of factors which we've got listed here but really um, what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, as a result of all this variability, um, all these different factors and from season to season there is a, a, a quite a large variability of nitrogen available to yeast from year to year uh, and there has been a lot of work shown in different studies that um, the nitrogen can vary from year to year. So why does this matter? Well, um, primarily, you know, nitrogen is, is a key driver for fermentation performance. Um, YAN is, is the usable nitrogen fraction of the total nitrogen present, so that's what the yeast are going to mostly go for. But your cell growth and fermentation rate are related to the initial YAN concentration, and there's a direct relationship between fermentation rate and the amount of nitrogen utilised by the yeast. So, that, so therefore, when all other factors are non-limiting, fermentation duration is a function of the initial yan concentration. So if the initial yan is low, the risk of a slow or stuck fermentation is increased. So this slide shows a Chardonnay uh, juice that was supplemented with a couple of different rates of, of yan. Um, so whilst too little yan can lead to sluggish, sluggish fermentation, so that's the green, the 160 milligrams per litre of nitrogen, um, too much uh, can be detrimental as well. So this work, um, this work they looked at sensory um, profiles as well, uh, and the wine that was most preferred by the sensory panel was the one that had the C120 yen, so that was a more fruity wine. Too much yen uh, resulted in more solventy characters, so esters, particularly ethyl acetate, were produced. So generally we want somewhere in the middle, the 320 in this particular case is, um, is desirable. So management of nitrogen can be complex because um, we don't just have to consider the rate of fermentation but also the effects on, on flavour. Yeah, and lack of yang can also lead to hydrogen sulphide production during fermentation. So. Uh, DAP generally we routinely add and to reduce um, to reduce this so we don't get as much uh, H2S. But so uh, here with more increase, more initial yen, you find that you get um, 
the onset of H2S production is, is decreased, so it becomes later, but then you get less produced. So H2S production is delayed and the amount produced is less when you have with increasing initial yam concentration. So in summary that higher yam DOP delays the onset of H2S and lowers the amount produced. So what are the recommended levels? Well, um, nitrogen demands here you can see the range from 330 to 470 would be the maximum of yeast. Um, minimum would be around about 150 for whites and 100 for reds. For flavour optimum profile, whites 250 to, two, to 350, reds maybe 250. Um, and just while I'm talking about yan uh, and, and I've been talking about um, different yeast strains, in the 2013 vintage where we also had a lot of stuck ferment queries, um, we had discussions with um, uh, representatives of Lalamand and Lalamand and they found um, because they've got a whole lot of data on who they sold yeast and which the yeast strains, they found that there were more ferments, um, more stuck ferments for wineries that used high nitrogen demand yeast. So you really need to know the nitrogen demand of the yeast that you're using and test for, for yarn so that you're getting, the yeast are getting the amount they need. So a high nitrogen demand yeast could use twice as much yarn uh, than a lower nitrogen demand yeast. Um, so this, this is, uh, and Lalamon certainly thought in 2013, uh, yeah, the, type, the strain of yeast and the nitrogen demand of the yeast was, was a significant factor. So temperature, uh, not so just, no, no, I'm not talking about the vineyard temperature now, I'm talking about uh, fermentation temperature. Uh, fermentation itself produces a lot of heat, so the fermentation of sugar to produce CO2, it produces energy, some of that's used to produce ATP, but uh, theoretically, if you calculate the amounts, uh, the ca calculations show that temperature, if all the like that heat stayed there, the temperature could go from 20 degrees at the start of fermentation up to 45 degrees. So it's a lot of uh, energy released and we know this because we have to cool fermentations. So the way I present in this slide shows that fermentation speed increases as the temperature rises but then the fermentation is also increasingly limited. So the influence in temperature uh, SO on the y-axis is initial sugar concentration. At 25 degrees, the fermentation is slower, but it actually completes. Um, whereas at 30 degrees, and especially 35 degrees, fermentation is more rapid, but it stops fermenting sugar uh, at lower concentrations, so it stops at concentrations S1 and S2 on the y-axis, uh, which are below uh, the sugar that, uh, that was used up by at 25 degrees. So to recapitulate, <coughs> an increase in temperature accelerates the fermentation but also adversely affects its limit. And the increased temperature also increases the toxicity of, of ethanol too. So yeast are particularly sensitive in their growth phase. Um, but, and it's just sensitive to temperature shock. So we want to have the juice enough warm up to the temperature of the yeast when once after it's been rehydrated. And so we don't want it more than five degrees, so 15 to 18 degrees, or probably closer to 18 would be idea, ideal uh, to minimise the grief, the growth, the yeast uh, growth lag phase. Um, don't commence cooling until 10% of the sugar is, is uh, fermented. Um, to avoid too much of a shock there, wait until they build up their cell numbers. Uh, avoid excessive temperatures, so greater than 30 degrees really becomes an issue. Um, the yeast becomes stressed, their viability is decreased, they produce more VA uh, and stuck fermentation is more likely. Um, excessive cooling or heating through exchanges, uh, certainly we believe that has been a cause sometimes where people have cooled something down from 30 down to 20, that's a much too big a jump and that will really shock the yeast and they'll just settle to the bottom and once you're on the bottom of the tank then they're not going to ferment. So tr keep cooling within five degree range. Sometimes we think overheating of the yeast in the cap might be an issue because that could be 10 degrees higher in the cap the temperature than the body of the wine. Another risk factor is turbidity. 
um, high turbidity ferments pro provide a substrate on which yeast can grow and they act as a trap for dissolved oxygen and they provide a source of sterols and fatty acids. So the sterols and fatty acids help yeast, the yeast build strong cell membranes uh, where, which are able to better protect against the toxic effect of ethanol I was discussing earlier. So um, yeast actually need these uh, sterols and fatty acids to build up strong membranes, otherwise they're going to be more susceptible. So in this slide, it best shows that excessive juice clarification results in the loss. Uh, well, it, when the turbidity is high, the fermentation rate is high, and they end up with low residual sugar. But if the turbidity is um, very low, so very highly clarified juice, then fermentation rate is low, and you end up with higher uh, residual sugar. sugar. So excessive glucose juice clarification results in less of those sterols and unsaturated fatty acids and some other nitrogenous nutrients, um, and this exacerbates the uh, toxicity of ethanol because the cell membranes aren't as strong as they, they, they should have been. So there's another way to effectively provide sterols uh, when you've got very, in very low turbid environments, um, uh, if they've been removed for, from centrifuging or filtering, uh, and that is you can use uh, oxygen. So when oxygen is present, yeast can actually synthesize the cells they need to make strong cell walls, but um, in an anaerobic environment, they can't do that. Um, um, so if the wine is highly protected uh, during the crushing, like lots of gas protection, then the oxygen can be low or um, can be assumed through oxidation um, and oxygen exposure during fermentation can vary. So aeration, uh, especially like about 10% after 10% of sugar is fermented, can be really good for the yeast uh, to be able to handle the higher alcohol that's going to come later on. So oops, sorry, technical difficulties. Just trying to get this window out of my way. Um, so fermentation response to oxygen. Oxygen stimulates the biomass formation and the fermentation rate. So you can see here what what's been, what they've done is that they've um, uh, add, added some oxygen at when 20% of the sugars been consumed, so that's the 80% there, and then uh, when 40% of sugar is consumed, uh, and then uh, and so on. So the orange line at the bottom is no no uh, addition of oxygen. You can see with the earlier the oxygen is added, uh, the quicker uh, the fermentation goes to completion. So take fermentation fermentation takes much longer when oxygen was added uh, added later. Yeast are very, you know, they're very stimulated by oxygen, um, and even after fermentation, if you've got a little bit of sugar left, um, and you've got wines in a barrel that might seem okay, then you recommend to tank that exposure to oxygen can kick them off, and then they can ferment that last bit of sugar that's there. Uh, when that becomes even more of a problem, if that yeast happens to be Saccharomyces, uh, uh, Britannomyces, sorry. So whilst oxygen is really good um, to add in nitrogen, um, some studies here um, show from this graph uh, of adding oxygen or nitrogen or both together. So fermentation um, graph here, the rate of, and the time. When oxygen was added, um, 5 milligrams per litre, the fermentation finished earlier, just like the previous slide. When DAP was added, it, it uh, had bit of an increase in fermentation rate and finished earlier. But when DAP and oxygen were added together, uh, the this response of the ferment to both those together was it was even more. So fermentation rate increased uh, and great more than just either of them on their own and, and finished earlier. So uh, adding DAP and oxygen um, maybe a third of the way through 
uh, fermentation these days is what we recommend. Very beneficial to to uh, get the ferment through. So, uh, just talking a little bit about flocculation. Um, if the yeast start to settle out, um, then they're not going to be involved in in uh, in fermentation, and CO2 keeps them in suspension. But if they start to flocculate, then you can get left with residual sugar. So, um, physical stirring can help prevent uh, fermentation and and help prevent stuck ferments sometimes when they start slowing down towards the yes, the end. Uh, if you've got a high bone mass, then it's probably good to avoid flocculating strains in uh, in those cases. Just showing here that uh, agitation um, increased uh, uh, and the fermentation when it was uh, either you know a low amount of acetic acid or some you know 0.5, and even when there was a higher amount. Um, the impact of agitated, which is a dotted line, is um, to increase the or decrease the fermentation time. Uh, so when it's not agitated, it's taking much longer, and uh, rate is, is slower. Fermentation rate is slower, but when you agitate, even with 1.3 grams of acetic acid, which could become inhibitory, especially if there's some other factors uh, present as well. Uh, in this case, we're able to get the uh, the fermentation keep going. So, um, strategies to uh, ensure the complete fermentation, minimising indigenous yeast. Uh, so, so um, particularly in um, hot hot weather, those um, those uh, wild yeast are going to use up nutrients before Saccharomyces are going to get there um, before this inoculation. So. Um, try to minimise those transport distance, time, and temperature. Uh, if pos possible, don't leave bins out in the sun. If they, um, and this, is, this becomes a logistics issue when everything uh, with compressed vintages and everything's arriving at the winery at the same time, and bins can sit out there for hours. Um, but you can get around that for somehow you have them in the shade, cover the bins. Um, deep it will, it'll all help to. Minimise the amount of growth of those indigenous yeasts before inoculation. Um, using sulphur dioxide in these situations, but also in combination with pH. You know, high pH encourages the growth of lactic acid bacteria. Um, hygiene is very important, as I mentioned earlier about grape bins, um, cultures growing in the corners of bins. Um, Optimise the yeast starter culture. Um, be careful with that. Follow directions well. Don't just tip all the yeast on top of the water and walk away because they, they're not getting rehydrated properly. Um, and aeration is an important step if in the absence of adding um, sterols. Uh, the air is, is really important and when we've I've talked to people about re-fermentation, uh, uh, restarting stock ferments and our procedure, uh, and when it hasn't worked, it's always nearly always been because they haven't aerated. As I mentioned earlier, that aeration is required to for the yeast to make um, those um, sterols that can, and uh, to to build strong cell walls so they can handle the high alcohol later on. Of course, if you're using a propagator, you've got to have enough higher cell health cell number. So, just as I mentioned before, don't do what's there on the on the right hand side. Just chuck it all on, on top of a beaker, and you've got a big pile of yeast not actually contacting water, but Try and increase the surface area. Um, if you're using tap water, um, you can remove the chlorine with something like sodium thiosulfate, um, which will remove chlorine if, if there's chlorine there, because that can be an inhibitory substance. Um, so these we're probably all familiar with these um, this procedure, but it, it is important um, to get the yeast down to a temperature uh, similar to the the juice temperature is going to go into in a, an appropriate time frame uh, and not having it sit there too long. So you can add just some of the yeast, uh, the juice back into the yeast um, to help that, that cooling that's a little cooling down of the yeast culture. Um, sometimes you can pour it from bucket to bucket to aerate it uh, if it's taking longer. 
So if um, if the ferment stops with less than 10 grams of sugar and the alcohol is reasonably low, then you could um, use fresh yeast sediments from an active ferment or you can use a starter culture and grape juice with a recommended yeast uh, and that will probably work because it's not too harsh conditions, less than 12% alcohol. But above that, generally you're going to need to use a, a rescue culture prepared by wise acclimatisation. Um, uh, and because this procedure helps build tolerance to the toxic substance, so we find this works pretty well um, in this situation by slowly acclimatising the yeast to the harsh conditions. Um, so we have that method on our website, um, and we have a whole lot of other information uh, on, the, on on this page, wine fermentation. So if you just go into Google search AWRI wine fermentation, it'll first thing up on that search would be take you to this page uh, and there's uh, information there uh, at primary fermentation as well as secondary fermentation and stuck, sem sec stuck secondary fermentations. Um, I was going to give a couple of examples here but I, don't, I think we're sort of running out of time so I, I might just skip, skip here um, to, uh, to acknowledgements. Um, colleague Jeff Cowie um, Paul Hemsky and Simon Schmidt of microbiologists and basically the whole AWRI team here and uh, funding uh, body of wine Australia. So I think we're over to questions now. Just as a reminder to ask a question, please type into the question section of your control panel in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For those with access to a microphone, there's an option of speaking directly with our presenter by clicking the raise hand button. This is located in the top left section of your control panel. other critical factors from this year. I can't see anything more there. So Jason Amos from Lalamond is um, um, saying he's, uh, there are two other critical factors from this year. So he's saying they experienced a lot of stuck ferments from processing fa facilities not being able to cope with the volume of fruit fermented uh, and pressure on cooling. Uh, and certainly we saw that in 2008, pressure on cooling systems. Um, and uh, one worry was able to sort of foresee this and got another cooling system in before uh, uh, they, they experienced this problem, but we certainly saw that in 2008. Uh, and, and Jason says, secondly and most importantly, most of the stark ferment, ferment queries this year uh, had uh, had been diluted with water in the must. This dilutes all the substrate and greatly affects the implantation and vitality, uh, in vitality of the culture. So Jason's saying um, the queries that he's dealt with, um, the must have been diluted with water, 
and of course this dilutes all the other substrates uh, and affects the vitality, vitality of the culture. Um, we don't always know exactly what's happened uh, there, but a lot of ferments we've seen this year were well, a variety of things like high alcohol, um, temperature shock, just um, uh, running out of tank space and pressing off too early, so you're losing a lot of heat um, uh, before you want to. Um, one one of them was a high sulfur um, yeast produced a lot of, a lot of sulfur, uh, very high level of sulfur, which became toxic. So Jason's saying that to combat this dose rate and detoxification of ferments is very important. So yes, um, detoxification by adding things like yeast holes which hopefully will absorb um, some of the toxic factors, but also maybe introduce some uh, sterols uh, and, and uh, survival factors for the yeast. So yeah, good points. Thanks, thanks, Jason. Okay, so um, Jonathan Creek uh, has a question, what is the most effective method of introducing oxygen into an active white fermentation, especially with larger tank sizes? Um, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I would probably say if you have um, you know, equipment for micro oxidation, uh, uh, yeah, micro ox equipment um, would probably be the best way to, to do that and you, you can regulate the amount uh, that you that you can get in that way too, um, although pretty well the yeast are going to use uh, use that oxygen up. Um, but yeah, that, that's that's a good question, and I think yeah, specialised equipment like the microwax is probably to be the best way uh, for a white ferment. So um, Kirsten uh, Greasy has um, a question. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, can you comment on the use of co-inoculation with MLF and yeast in hot years? Is it a good idea or not? Um, well, if it's probably a best question directed to the supplier. So if you're using the yeast and bacteria from one supplier, then that's probably good because they're, they're products are probably going to be compatible, but if you use a yeast from one supplier and a bacterium from another supplier, then they may not be may not be um, compatible uh, and you can get interactions there uh, in, in, in inhibition of one or the other. Of, um, so I think this is probably a question best asked to the supplier as I don't really have um, any information or data about co-inoculation, whether it is a good idea or not in hot years, and Jason might uh, might have an idea on this. Okay, so there's a question from Hayden Menzies, um, which is a good one. Which he says we talk about increase of sulfur dioxide uh, it can help, but obviously not too high to inhibit yeast growth. So, what is the preferred rate to protect uh, and still ferment to completion? Do you think? Well, that's a good question, and it really depends on the pH as well, the amount and the amount of um, micro floor present. So in 2008, there was a lot, a lot of um, bacteria around. So uh, 
Um, in that case, we were saying you know, at about 70 parts of, of sulfur, and I'm sure that's a high amount, but we were saying we could sort of like add a bit of a, add a sacrificial use culture first to um, to uh, get rid of that free SO2 um, before so adding maybe 10% of the culture, then uh, later on adding the rest of the culture. So the first bit is just basically binding up that sulfur with our saldehyde and then uh, so that, that the, the sulfur dioxide isn't too high, but um, it's a hard one to, uh, to answer because the lower the pH then the more uh, toxic that sulfur is going to be to the yeast as well. Um, and certainly we've got data showing that, that uh, if together sulfur and lower pH decreases the, the viability of the yeast. Um, so, you know, at pH 3.5, you know, an average value might be 50 or 60 parts of sulfur. If you, if it's, um, uh, yeah, not too bad of a heat wave year or not too hot, but so bad that you've got uh, masses of um, micro growth. Uh, in 2008, we had some juice coming in. By the way, that what makes it so they can smell VA uh, uh, after they crushed. Uh, so in that case, you do have to add a lot of sulfur to knock them out. Otherwise, you end up with those mousy wines. Um, as I say, you, if you add that sulfur, then you add a, end up with a high free, you can knock that back by using sacrificial yeast culture. So a similar question from Tobias Anstead, thanks Tobias. Uh, and as, yeah, it agrees, that's obviously depend on pH, temperature, etc. Is a, is a recommended level of sulfur for red grapes to control indigenous microbes prior to ferment. Um, yeah, it does does depend, but as I said, on 2008 when we had a lot of problems and if you saw the high VAs there early and I've talked about that and the mousiness um, and other other issues with pediococcus, um, we were saying add, you know, 70, 80 parts of sulfur uh, in, in, that, in that case when it's pretty high high risk um, and then, you know, then, then reduce that high sulfur um, by adding uh, maybe a high, make, preparing a higher yeast inoculum and using some of it as a sacrificial inoculum to bind up the sulfur before adding the whole lot in. Uh, and this thing does seem to work. But, but but without heat waves, I would say probably add you know 50 parts of sulfur, 40 to 50 parts. If, if the fruit it doesn't look damaged, because um, uh, as long as you've got good yeast culture and the temperature sh is there's no temperature shock when you add the yeast, then Saccharomyces will take will dominate fairly early on. Um, so you don't need as much sulfur. But in in the heat wave periods when there's a lot of microflora, you've got to knock them out because they're just using up nutrients and it'll take a long time before Saccharomyces can, can dominate. Jason Amos sent a message saying, could you repeat whatever it was that you asked that Kirsten Christie asked? All right. Um, so, um, to Jason, uh, um, Kirsten was saying, can we comment on co use of co-inoculation with MLF bacteria and yeast in hot years? Is it a good idea or not? Um, as I was saying, it's probably best to ask the manufacturers about that. You've probably had more calls about that than, than we have. Um, Oh, um, so Jason is saying co-inoculation is about managing the risk. If you're sure of an easy and reliable alcoholic fermentation, co-inoculation is a very good strategy. 
So Jason's saying if we are concerned about with the alcohol fermentation pressure with stuck ferments, then co-inoculation is not advisable as we don't want the malleage to finish before the completion of alcohol, alcoholic fermentation. Uh, and that's what I'm concerned about too. If as I was saying, if you're using yeast and bacteria from different suppliers and the bacteria or the alcoholic fermentation and malo going together, there's always that risk of getting of mousiness because um, you've got alcohol there, you've got sugar, and you've got amino acids which are required to produce mousiness. So Jason's saying if you add a lot of water to dilute the sugar must, then alcoholic fermentation will struggle. Co-inoculation is not advisable. So I guess in hot years, if you're more likely to have high bome fruit, then you're more likely to add water, um, and then it's not a good idea to add uh, add co co-inoculate under those circumstances. So as Jason says, it all comes back to risk management. Okay, so I might just sum up now. Um, so yes, we do get stuck ferments every year and um, with increased rates of um, heat waves occurring with the sort of climate, the way it's changing and compressed vintage, um, it, it stuck ferments may become uh, more, more of an issue than they have in the past. Um, but some of the things we've looked at today, so um, obviously ethanol is a, is a big factor, so high BOMAs lead to high ethanol and uh, YAND uh, are important um, and minimising the microflora in the vineyard, uh, knocking them out um, or trying to minimise their, their growth uh, is going to Give the best, and you know, have good yeast cultures. Um, follow ferments, so you can see if um, you know, both preferably using graphs, so you can see early on where, with something slowing down, because then you can do something about it. Uh, uh, no point just writing things in tables, um, those sorts of things. Uh, and we have some fermentation um, plotting software uh, on our website, which. Uh, we can even predict uh, how fermentation is going to go too, so that can be useful in, in predicting if something is going to be an issue. Okay, well I might uh, finish up there. Thank you Adrian for presenting today and thank you to everyone who attended and took part in today's session. For attendees, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording and a link to a survey. And the next AWRI webinar is on the 8th of September when Colin Hinsey from Taylor's Wines will present the practical implementation of precision viticulture in vineyards. If you would like to register for this webinar, please visit the AWRI website. That's all we have for today and thank you for attending and I look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.